Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, our second last uh, Wednesday men's Bible study for this fall season. Uh, we will have tonight's study and next week, and then we'll take a break for uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, New Year, whatever else we can stick in, and uh, begin again in January. But uh, glad you're here, glad uh, to uh, uh, be able to continue as we uh, study the Bible together. And um, uh, only announcement is we have uh, the videos available on uh, our site. I think I don't have last week's up yet, but I will get that up. And uh, we want to, at least by next week, we want to have all the previous ones up. We just all feel better about it. So we'll get that done. Uh, let's pray and we'll get started. <clears throat> Father, again, we uh, come before you week by week. Um, mindful of uh, the last seven days that you sustain us with your grace and with your love, that you give us so much more than we could uh, ever ask for, that you have given us uh, life and ultimately that you have given us forgiveness through Jesus and given us new life in that. And so, Father, we want to spend our evening uh, focused on you and looking into your word. And so our prayer would be uh, that you would speak through your word, that it would be a time that would be either a great reminder of truths that we already know, or maybe it's fresh and new, and that uh, we would be encouraged, uh, that we would be uh, uh, strengthened, and that we would be mindful of uh, the various ways in which you call us to act as believers. In the end, Father, we want to be uh, men who live wisely before you and that uh, we live our lives and our responsibilities in our families and uh, uh, in our jobs and whatever situations we find ourselves, even as citizens of this land, that we would honor and glorify you with our lives. And so we pray that our time together would be instructive for that purpose. Uh, give us wisdom and guidance as we look to your word for that which is true and right and help us to uh, uh, receive and impart those truths in our lives that we could uh, live those out in the day-by-day -day activities that we find ourselves in. We pray for the presence of your spirit and that you would lead and guide through your spirit to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you have your Bibles this evening, I'd invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We have been in a series, I've simply called it our life, that is our Christian life is what I mean by that. And in this series, we're really just trying to look at things that God has asked all believers to do. Uh, and so if you have been with us over the last several weeks, we have looked at things like baptism. God has called all to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin and what that uh, all means. We've talked about the Lord's Supper and communion. and We've talked about prayer and Bible reading. And we've talked about loving the Lord our God. We've talked about worship. We've talked about what does it mean to deny ourselves. And so we will continue on that. And sort of uh, Ephesians 6 will be a helpful passage in, in understanding sort of the framework of all that we're uh, working on. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. So Ephesians is a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. This is a church that Paul planted. So when you plant a church, kind of that, that first pastor, the founding pastor, the planting pastor, like Pastor Chuck is for us here at Stonebriar, it, it's, he, he holds a very special role, even as churches get on to their second pastor and third pastor, however the, the time unfolds. And so Paul is a very special, has a very special place in the hearts of the believers in Ephesus. And so he writes this letter, this book of Ephesians, and really it's a book about the understanding the role of the church. It, it, really, it really has a, a, a two-part message or, or a, a two-part approach to understanding the church, not a two-part message, but a two-part approach where uh, the first three chapters are explaining sort of the doctrine of the church, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, we get a therefore or so that, and, and then this is how we to live out our lives as a believer. And so when we get to Ephesians 6, it, it's, this, it's the very tail end of all this discussion about what it means to be a body of believers, what it means to be a church, and, and how that's all uh, put together. And probably Probably these are familiar words. I'll put them on the uh, screen as well. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. 
Finally, Paul writes about 10 years after he planted the church in Ephesus, he writes back to the church, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Take your stand against the devil's schemes. Which is kind of interesting. Probably none of us, none of us did that this week. I mean, we don't schedule in, man, on Tuesday at, at, at 4, I got that, you know, that's where I'll be taking my stand. I mean, what, what is Paul saying? What does it mean? He's now going to use language that we tend not to think about. We tend not to talk this way. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. No, it's not. I mean, is that right? Paul is saying that our problem isn't the people, it isn't flesh and blood, blood, it's it's these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Well, from my vantage point, it kind of looks like people. Right? I mean, don't we think, when you think of challenges that you're facing maybe in your life or in your family or things that you're concerned about, or maybe it's politics and the current government or whatever, we still think about it as the people, right? These people are part of the problem. And Paul says, no, that's not, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. There's something behind the evil that people do, right? People in Israel today might be saying, our problem is Hamas. And Paul is saying, no. Hamas are actors in a play that's being orchestrated by spiritual forces of evil. That is, spiritual forces of evil have gotten a grip on these men who have created these atrocities. And so he's, he's giving us sort of a different level or a different playing field. Our struggle is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So if you've been with us, as we've talked about all these various commands that all believers are given, I've always used this phrase each week about, you know, prayer, uh, and we think about prayer, and we go, oh, right, i got to inform God about all these needs, and then you find out, no, no, he's omniscient, he already knew before you asked him, and so on, so why am I praying? And then I would say, well, it's a physical sign, it's something that you're called to do, to speak the words, to bow your head, fold your hands, those kinds of things, to bring before the Lord, and it's a physical sign of something that's going on in the spiritual world. And so what Paul is saying here at the end of Ephesians chapter 6 is really something that I think we as a, as a group looked in, in Matthew 16 several weeks ago where uh, Jesus is telling Peter, uh, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And so really the church is birthed in spiritual warfare. That, that is, those outside, the, and again the church is, is not this building, right? The church is the people of God. And so people who are not part of the church, people who are not believers, the issue is a spiritual issue. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual pushing back uh, of the gates of hell, which are trying to preserve unbelievers, and the church is reaching, or the Spirit of God is reaching into that group of unbelievers and drawing people to himself and into the body of believers. And, and so this, the church is in the midst of spiritual warfare. That's what uh, Matthew 16 is getting at when Jesus is teaching his disciples. And now Paul is saying the same thing, that the church is in the middle of this struggle, and it's a spiritual struggle. And so it's interesting how he articulates it here. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, against people, but against rulers and authorities and powers of the dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so there's a whole hierarchy, could I say, of, of you've got rulers and then authorities and however they fit together and powers of the dark world and spiritual forces of evil that, that are all going on. And yet we all live in the physical world, right? We deal with things that we can see and, and hear. And so we think when we have problems, we think of the people who cause them, not the spiritual forces of evil behind them, Right? But yet, there is a sense which is, there is a spiritual world that we are to be aware of, 
And so what God gives us is he gives us physical things to do, physical acts, because we're physical beings, right? We, we, we experience the world through our senses, right? We see, we hear, we taste, we touch, we smell. We experience everything through our senses in a physical world, and yet God assigns us physical activities that actually behind them are, are, are really something on the spiritual plane. And that's what I've really tried to show you, that everything that we're called to do actually has, if I can say it this way, a spiritual underbelly. So, so prayer, we don't need to inform God, he already knows, but we're called to pray to remind us how dependent we are on him and that he does respond to our petitioning. So when we pray and ask for God to act, he'd love to act. He, he wants to honor our prayers if we're willing to come. If we go and say, well, this is dumb. I mean, he already knows what I'm going to say before I say it. Why would I say it? We then lose the spirit, the physical act, then loses the spiritual reality that's behind it. And so in one sense, what Paul is saying here is all our lives, everything that we do, there is a spiritual component behind it. We, we are physical beings, but we are also spiritual beings. And so we live in physical, our physical lives in ways that also include a spiritual, uh, a spiritual purpose behind it. And so what I hope to show as we talk about our sort of our next uh, discussion this evening is I hope I can help you to see how they're all interrelated. And, and maybe I should just say it now and kind of get it over with. Your entire life, everything you say, everything you do, your attitudes, your actions, everywhere you've ever been, everything you've ever done, all your abilities and talents, the things that you work on, your education, all of those things are to be a, a physical sign of a spiritual reality. That, that is, we live out our lives recognizing there's something spiritual behind it. That, that, that we are living in a physical world, and so we're not called to, to, to like Paul doesn't say, I want you to start identifying and charting all these, all these uh, rulers and authorities and, and spiritual forces of evil. He, he doesn't say any of those things. He just says those things are realities even though we don't see them. And so we need to recognize when people are, are acting evil, uh, one of the things we want to do is we want to be angry at the evil behind them and long to see Christ redeem them. Doesn't that seem like an odd prayer, though? I want to pray now that Christ would redeem all the members of Hamas. And it seems strange, right? I mean, they've acted like terrorists, and now is, do we pray that? But what if he would? I mean, what if there would be a revival amongst the Palestinian people turning to Jesus? What if there'd be a revival amongst the Jews turning to Jesus? And so it's interesting, Paul is instructing the church that behind everything there is, there is a spiritual battle going on, and that's what we're part of, and it plays itself out in physical realities, in challenges. And so, uh, well, everything we do is to sort of be done to the glory of God, God gives us very specific things to do, like pray and read the Bible or hear the word of the Lord or, or, or love the Lord or love our neighbor as ourself or, or worship or deny ourselves as we talked about last week. There are very specific things that we do to help remind us of that spiritual battle that goes on sort of beyond the physical realm. And so we don't want to make it weird, but we do want to recognize that God is spirit and yet he relates to us through physical activities that we all can understand. He, he didn't give us his word merely orally that we could all kind of, well, I think I remember what it says, right? We actually get it written down. We can read it and reread it, and it's translated carefully, and, and we can study it carefully. He deals with us, if you will, on the physical plane because we're physical beings, but we're also mindful that these physical bodies that, that we are in will one day die unless Christ returns, uh, or unless Christ has already returned, maybe that's a better way to say it, a and yet we, we live on. As believers, we live in the very presence of Christ, awaiting the resurrection of our, uh, of our eternal body when our eternal body is joined back with our spirit or soul that is living in the presence of Christ. And, and so we're always mindful of we're living, and this is what it means to live the Christian life, we are living recognizing there are spiritual undertones to whatever's going on. 
So let me say it really specifically, So, because I, I think you'll, you'll all... So uh, a year from now, there's going to be an election, right? And behind the election, and I know nothing about what, what the results are going to be, is a spiritual battle. Does that make sense? That is going to be a spiritual battle. Okay? I, I, I get emails from different lists and so on. And so uh, right now in the state of Texas, there is a spiritual battle going on on what the Texas school board will allow to be taught to Texas children in public schools in Texas. There's a spiritual battle. One group says we need to do more of this, and one group is saying, no, that's the last thing we want to get into our schools and into the heads of our children. And so there's a battle going on. Now, what, what's really going on is debates within, w w down in Austin within particular uh, chambers of, of the government and so on. But behind that is a spiritual right and wrong. And so we need to be mindful of that. We need to recognize that. And then we need to recognize when God calls us to do something, like pray, like read, like worship, that all those things, even though worship might mean raising your hand, it might mean reading God's word, it might mean uh, sacrifice, as we saw with Abraham called to sacrifice Isaac, but all of it has sort of a spiritual uh, uh, reality behind it that our spiritual God is glorified in the physical acts which we do for his glory. So that's sort of what we're getting at. Uh, let's do it. Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Here's where we want to start. So I want to try and help us to see that, that spiritual reality that's behind all the physical activities that God calls us to. And once we read Psalm 24, you'll see immediately that it is not apparent what I'm talking about. But that's okay. We'll get there. Psalm 24. It's a psalm of David. We don't really know with Psalm 24 uh, uh, any of the background behind it. We don't know how the psalm was used. In some psalms we know that, in others we don't. Um, so I'd just like to read Psalm 24, and uh, we'll start to see what it's saying. And I want to show you a theme in Scripture, and then we'll work from that theme. It begins in Psalm 24. Uh, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's. I should just say, this psalm really has sort of two stanzas. I'm going to call them stanzas, two verses. But if I say verses, we'll know in our Bible it's going to be ten verses, right? So to, like a song, it's got two stanzas. There's, there's kind of one through six and then seven through ten. And, and so I want to make sure that we understand both stanzas and then how they kind of relate together a little bit. Um, so here we go. The earth <clears throat> is the Lord's and everything in it the world and all who live in it. You'll remember that we talked about in Hebrew poetry that every two lines, the most common thing in the Psalms is each of the two lines are saying the same thing a different way. So you'll see that here, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, that's our line one, the world and all who live in it. That's the second line saying the same thing as the first and that's sort of the, the rhythm of Hebrew poetry. Um, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Again, two lines with one main thought. Uh, who can ascend the mountain of the Lord and who may stand in its holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindi vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him who seek your face, God of Jacob. Okay, that's kind of stanza one. And then we get to stanza two. Your Bible might have an extra line space in there. Maybe it's playing with the indenting. Uh, stanza two, verse seven. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory might come in. So just briefly, this is common in Hebrew. This might sound a little crazy in English, but one of the ways you can create force in Hebrew poetry or emphasis is you personalize things that aren't personal. So here we're personalizing gates and hinges, uh, gates and uh, doors, gates and doors. And we're giving them, we're acting like they're people to try and help communicate the message sort of artistically or poetically as they're trying to do. So lift up your heads, you gates. That's referring to the gates of Jerusalem. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. 
Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. So poetic, and poetic probably in a way that we tend not to think about and so on. But obviously there's a theme here, and, and I want to try and connect sort of stanza one, and even among stanza one and into stanza two, how does this fit together? How does this psalm uh, fit together? So we begin very simply, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, right? Genesis 1, 1, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is just reminding us that everything belongs to God. Everything is God's. He founded it on the seas, established it on the waters. That is, he created all these things, and we could go back and read Genesis 1, and we'd see all, those, uh, uh, the, all, all that same idea here. And then it asks the question, who might ascend the mountain of the Lord? And when we see this question, we've kind of got to think about what are the people who originally are reading this psalm thinking about, okay? And so in, in Jerusalem, you would go to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, and, and the temple, when, once it was there, once Solomon builds the temple, uh, or even the tabernacle, when David brings the tabernacle in before the temple is built, you would go up the mountain to worship the Lord. And so notice the question, um, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Well, ascend the mountain of the Lord, that's kind of a cue they're going up to worship. Who's allowed to worship? That's what it's asking, right? Who's allowed to worship? Who can go up the hill to worship the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Well, here's the, here's the requirements. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. So my first question is, what is the relationship between verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and verse 4, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart? We tend to think clean hands and a pure heart, rightly, that, well, that reminds us of sin. We don't go before the Lord with sin. We need to be cleansed from our sin, forgiven in Old Testament, the appropriate sacrifice. Today, uh, as believers in Christ, we confess our sins to the Lord. He receives his forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9, and 10 is very instructive there in helping us to understand. And so clean hands, pure heart, we kind of get that. We should kind of think this through, though. So clean hands would be actions that we do. Pure heart would be the inside, right? The outside is clean, the inside is clean. So we understand that related to sin, but there's more to this because why does this particular psalm start with talking about the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it? He founded it on the seas and he established it on the waters. How is all this greatness that everything belongs to God related now to verse 3 and 4. Who can go up the mountain? Who has clean hands and a pure heart? Well, part of it would be making yourself right and, and, and uh, receiving God's forgiveness so that you can come, if you will, without sin in their understanding in the Old Testament era. But there's more than that. There's more going on because this psalm is all connected. These are not random verses stuck together. This all fits together. Who has clean hands and a pure heart? Someone who knows that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. See, the, song, the psalm, or the song even, starts with this statement. It's all God's. That's the statement, right? The earth belongs to the Lord and everything in it. And it goes on and kind of makes it poetically really four times. Everything belongs to the Lord. And then who can go to the Lord in worship? Clean hands, pure heart? Clean hands, pure heart. Well, one of the things you would have to do is you go to worship the Lord recognizing who he really is, the owner of everything. He owns the mountain that you climb. He owns whatever's on top of the mountain where, where the sacrifice is made, where the worship is done. He owns it all. And, and, and so there is this acknowledgement that part of the purpose of Psalm 24 is the idea of the basis of worship is recognizing it all belongs to God. So let's say it this a different way. Imagine that the place where you worshiped you were in a good financial situation, you were able to donate half of it, okay? So now you're going up to worship the Lord and he is worthy because he provided, well, he provided half and you provided half, right? So, so he comes a little less worthy, does that make sense? 
like if we think it's, it's us and him working together and I, I made a big donation, I made a big contribution, then, th- then we have a little lower view of who he is. So what this psalm is saying, it starts off, don't forget everything is the Lord, everything belongs to the Lord, and then when you come before the Lord, you need to come with clean hands and a pure heart, which would include recognizing, submitting, to the fact that it all belongs to the Lord. So it's a psalm to remind the people of Israel of, of God's ownership of everything. And, and, and that the mindset has to be right. It really is just another version of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a reminder that because he created the heavens and the earth, he's worthy And so this is the imagery you get in the second stanza. Lift up your heads, you gates. Don't you dare keep your gates closed. Open them up. Here comes the king of glory. That that is, once we have the right understanding of who God is, well, one of the things, even from this psalm, it leads us towards worship, right? We talked about worship a couple of weeks ago, but understanding who God is, that he owns everything, it leads us towards worship. Well, this is a theme that I want to show you across multiple passages. I I want to really establish this. I want to show you that this runs all the way through Scripture, and we'll talk about sort of why that's important. Genesis 1-1, I already inferred to it, God created in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is, it's all His. Everything you've ever encountered is created. Everything you've ever encountered is created by God. It's all His workmanship, okay? Uh, Next place I'm going to go is... um, Oops, um, Exodus 9. I've got several uh, uh, verses here. I'll, I'll jump a little bit, Exodus 9. And, and so in, in the book of Exodus here, we, we are looking at, if you just kind of remember the context, God has raised up Moses to deliver his people from Egypt, and he's going to take them to the promised land. And, and so um, if you kind of understand, remember the methodology God had chosen for this is that he's going to do 10 plagues. And in these 10 plagues, he's going to deliver his people uh, uh, from the, uh, or to the promised land from the hand uh, of the Egyptians and the Pharaoh. Now the thing about Pharaoh is Pharaoh was really understood as this great God, small g, uh, uh, the God of Egypt, who, who really owned everything. And so, really, the ten plagues are this battle between the Pharaoh who owns everything and the God who created and owns everything, right? It's really a question of ownership, and so God ends up to be ten for ten over Pharaoh, right? That's how the plagues go, that, that, that God is showing this. And some of that's hard for us because we don't think that way. We're not Egyptians. We, we don't think the way they thought. But this verse helps us to understand. Moses replied, When I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands in prayer to the Lord. The thunder will stop and there will be no more hail. So this is the end of that plague of of hail that God had sent. So that you might know that the earth is the Lord's. And we might read that and go, well, of course it is. What, What would you be thinking? Well, Pharaoh would be thinking that the earth is his. Because that's how they're raised. Pharaohs were raised to be small g gods. And that the earth belongs to them. And so one of the things that's going on in the book of Exodus is God is showing that you don't have control of the earth. That God has control of the earth. And we could show that multiple places. I'm going to only show two Exodus passages. Here's Exodus 19. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, this is now they're out of the land, I should just say. They've crossed the Red Sea, and they're, they're at the base of Mount Sinai. And in Exodus 20, they'll get the Ten Commandments. So this is just before they're getting the Ten Commandments. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although, although the whole earth is mine... You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So this is God speaking to Moses, and he's just sort of along the way. Although the whole earth is mine, everything is his, you're going to be a unique possession for me. He doesn't really describe it more than that, than other than saying you're going to be a kingdom of priests, you're going to be a holy nation. So everything belongs to the Lord, every nation belongs to the Lord, but he has one particular nation or one particular people that, that, that is going to be uniquely his, his treasured possession. Okay, so everything is his, Israel is uniquely his. We see kind of that articulation here in, in Exodus 19. 
let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. So between Exodus and Deuteronomy, they get out of the land. They go to the promised land, the land of Canaan. They send in the spies. The land looks great, but they're very intimidated by the cities that have walls and the fact that the people are tall. They're big people. And so they don't ultimately trust that the Lord will deliver them. And so the Lord lets them wander for 40 years as that unbelieving generation dies away. Once that unbelieving generation has died, their children are now ready, and then the, the same offer is given to them, and that really is the book of Deuteronomy. The offer is, will you trust me to deliver you into the promised land? Ultimately, that younger generation says, yes, we will trust you, and they go in under Joshua. So the book of Deuteronomy is the re-giving of the law to that younger generation, that second generation whose parents died off while wandering in the desert. Deuteronomy chapter 10, along the way in that sermon, uh, to the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it. That is, throughout the message, we'll right now in the Old Testament, we'll see it all the way through the New, we are constantly reminded everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God, everything belongs to God, everything belongs to God. And so then you can start to see it here. Here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 2. He raises, talking about God, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He sits uh, them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's, upon them he has set the world. That is, because he owns everything, the second part of the verse, he then can act the way he does for the poor. That is, he can raise them up that he can seat them on seats of honor. Because it's all his, he has the power to bring people up. Does that make sense? Part of the message there, it's going on for Samuel 2, the beginning of, uh, of uh, Samuel's life, talking about Israel and sort of the uniqueness of God. So many times this idea that everything belongs to God has just kind of found its way into passages sort of that come by the way. Here in First Chronicles 29. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Clearly, this is a passage of worship. And why do we worship God? Why is he, why is he great and powerful and glorious and majestic and, and, and full of splendor? Because everything is his. Everything belongs to him. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come, <clears throat> pardon me, come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands, all strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Y you can see it in many passages, and I just want to kind of show you through a, through a series of them that this is a common theme. It's a theme we know. We probably don't even have any questions on it. That's fine. Joshua 3. So Joshua, now they are going to uh, get to the land, and Joshua's going to lead them into the land. You've got to remember that they start off on the east side of the Jordan, in modern day, the country of Jordan, and they need to cross the Jordan River, and then they're going to get to Jericho, and that's going to be their first test, is are you going to be able to defeat Jericho, which is a walled city? And, and so in Joshua 3, they're getting ready to cross the Jordan River. Now this is tricky because there's no bridges, and it happens to be at flood, flood stage, so it's particularly high. So it's kind of the worst time to do it, and there's no easy way to do it. you got to help. you got to get across. you got to get your wife across, your kids across. If you got a donkey, you got to get your donkey across. It's hard to know how much cattle are involved here because they've been wandering in the desert, but there's probably some. And so navigating a river crossing is just really hard. It's hard for anyone in any any of those first, in those early centuries before there's bridges, this is just a hard thing to do, okay? So as soon, so, so God says, listen, I'll go first. So the priests are, are, are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, it's the wooden box with the gold, uh, gold covered and so on. And, and so the priests are going to carry the presence of God, is going to go before them, and they're going to, if you will, follow God into the land. That, that's the plan. As soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord the Lord of all the earth, just a, almost a throwaway comment, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. And so this younger generation of the parents who went through the Red Sea crossing coming out of Egypt, as it turns out, God does, if you'll allow me to call it this, a, a mini Red Sea. He, he stops the Jordan River at flood stage, so they get to cross on dry land. 
that very first event would be a harrowing event, and they got to do it on dry land. Because when the priests touched the water, the water stopped flowing, and they got to cross over. And in the process of reminding us of that, we always get the reminder, the Lord of all the earth. The Lord of all the earth, well, what are we supposed to get from that? He's the kind of guy who can stop the Jordan and then start it again. Right? And, and so that's why we get those, those comments, because we're going to see the Lord act, and it's like, wow, he's able to stop the Jordan. Yeah, he's the Lord of all the earth. You, you see why it's there? It's there to remind us he's the one who would have the authority to, to, to stop a river from flowing, to pile up water, how, however he did that. He did that. Uh, Job. Always fun to uh, uh, draw something from Job. Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Uh, everything under heaven belongs to me. God is speaking to Job. Who has a claim against me, that's God, that I must pay? Everything belongs to me. You're not really, Job, in a position to ask me when I, in fact, own everything. It's all mine. You'll remember Job was a very rich man and in a very difficult position. All I want you to see, and I think this is important in Bible study in general, if we don't follow the themes, it kind of feels like the Bible is about 3,786 different things, which is really hard to remember. But what we see actually is the Bible isn't about that many things. There are themes that run through it, and learning those themes, it's much easier to get your arms around because what you have is certain things that are repeated over and over and over. And all I'm really trying to show you is that everything belongs to the Lord, and it's everywhere in Scripture. It's all over in the stories. Here we are in Psalm 89. The heavens are yours, are, uh, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that's in it. Well, we already knew that. We read Genesis 1. It's, it's just all over the place. Uh, Psalm 95. Uh, for the Lord uh, is the great God, the king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form dry land. Okay, so that's all about God. He owns everything, right? It's a poetic way of present presenting that God owns everything. Come, let's bow down and worship. You follow? That as soon as we get who he is, the natural response is, well, we don't own stuff like that. It's all his. He becomes worthy. We've talked about worship before, but you see this. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care, right? The picture is he's the shepherd, we're the sheep. And, and so uh, in that picture, we're recognizing that, that he is over all, that he owns all, that, that he is great, and, and as he is described in the first uh, few verses in this passage. So we see the same thing. Uh, all right, uh, one from Haggai here in the Minor Prophets, just to kind of remind you of the story of Haggai. So if we get the basic story, uh, we, we sort of got them, uh, I guess, with Joshua into the land, and Joshua will conquer the land, uh, right? They'll, they'll basically conquer most of the land, and that generation with Joshua is faithful. And once in the land, uh, we're going to get to a time of, like, who leads after Joshua? We're, we're not kings. God is their king. They don't have a king and so on. And so what's going to be the system? And the generation after Joshua's generation ends up already to be unfaithful. And they're more interested in worshiping the gods of the land, the gods of Baal and Asherah, the Canaanites, than they are worshiping the one true God. And so God ends up raising judges to inflict judgment when the people will cry out for him. So we have that whole story of the judges and judgment that comes next. And really the judges end with this very unique char uh, character named Samuel, who in one sense is a judge and in one sense is a prophet. He's a unique man of God who provides good godly leadership to Israel. A and it's after him then there's really no plan. I mean, who's going to come next? And Samuel's children are not faithful. He has sons who are uh, people who expect, or men who ex who uh, accept bribes, and so they're not fit to lead, and so the people cry out for a king. So after the period of judges, ending with Samuel and his unique role as sort of part prophet, part king, part, part priest, he's really all, all, all of those, 
um, Samuel is called to anoint Saul as king. And so Israel then turns into a kingdom, and we have three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, and then that kingdom divides in two, right? And so you remember you have Israel in the north, that's ten tribes, and Judah in the south, that's two tribes. And eventually the north will be lost to Assyria. So now we're only left with two tribes, and those two tribes then will get conquered by Babylon. They'll go into exile for 70 years. And after 70 years, they'll come back, and that's where we pick up on the story of Haggai. So Haggai is a prophet who comes after the 70-year exile. And the reason all of this is important is Haggai has a really interesting message. When they come back, you remember Babylon had destroyed um, the city of Jerusalem, had broken down the walls and destroyed the temple. Now if we think back to that temple, that temple was built by Solomon. And so I don't know if you ever really think about this, but... How did they afford to build that temple? Well, the Bible tells us a couple of things. Number one, Solomon increased the taxes uh, a lot, and that produced a lot of money for them to get all the gold that they wanted to use and all the, uh, the, the elaborate decorations that they used. Solomon was a very rich man and used some of his wealth. Some people from other nations donated uh, materials for the temple. Um, but the number one donor to building that temple was David. If you remember, David wanted to build the temple. God said, no, I'll let your son do it. And so David takes all his wealth. He doesn't pass it on to his son. He passes it on for the temple. It's given to Solomon to build the temple. So you have all of David's wealth, plus all these other sources of income to build this amazing temple that the Babylonians destroy. So that temple is gone, that city is destroyed, and then they're in Babylon for seven years, and then they come back and they start to rebuild, okay? And so God says, start with the temple, and they do. So they come back, and uh, we're in 536 B.C., that's 536 years, roughly speaking, before the birth of Christ. They get back, and the year they get back, the year that they go back to Jerusalem, they lay the foundation for the temple, and they start to celebrate, then they face some opposition. We have now the, some of the people who lived in the land, some of the people from Assyria, they're eventually going to be called Samaritans, and we'll meet them often in the New Testament. But Samaritans start to oppose the rebuilding of the temple and rebuilding. Later, they're going to oppose uh, uh, Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the walls. That's going to come later on in the book of Nehemiah. But they're going to bring some opposition to rebuilding the temple, and so the people stop. And, and so... Partly because there's some opposition and partly because wouldn't you rather kind of fix up your house first, right? Like, God, help me fix up my house so my wife's happy and my vineyards are planted and so on, and then I'll help fix up your house. And God raises up Haggai and says, I got an idea. Fix my house and then I'll help you fix up yours. No, 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 no. We'll, we'll do ours first and then we'll do yours, Lord. And God says, no, I'm just going to make sure your house never gets fixed. And so for 20 years, uh, 16 years, excuse me, for 16 years they don't work on the temple and they try to fix their houses and the Lord frustrates them. He makes sure it doesn't work. He, they're working against the Lord and the Lord raises up Haggai and, 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 and so the question is, but we don't have any money. Remember, they go into exile, Herod, uh, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar steals the gold from the temple, and, and that's from David, and that's from Solomon, and that's from the Queen of Sheba, and 10,000 other places, and, and, and he, he steals it, and that goes through the Babylonian courtyard, and the various kings are using the goblets and so on. You, you'll know some of those stories from the book of Daniel, but when they come back, they don't have any gold. They don't have David's fortune. They don't have Solomon's fortune. They've got no money. I mean, really, God, you really want us to rebuild the temple? We've, we've got nothing of what we used to have when the first one was built. How do you expect us to build the temple? And here's what the prophet Haggai says, or God says through the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, uh, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. What silver, what gold? Well, that would be the silver and gold from all the nations. That's the message of the book of Haggai, is that, oh no, all the silver and gold, it's all mine. Yeah, but some of it's still in Babylon. Uh-huh, but it's mine. 
Some of it's in Persia now. Yep, that's mine too. Some of it's scattered all over who knows where. Yep, it's all mine. And one time, at one point, I'm going to shake the nations and I'll bring that gold back. It's interesting. He actually does that under Herod at the time of Jesus when Herod then uh, uh, tries to appease the Jews by then replating that temple that they rebuilt, the plain Jane version, with uh, replating it with, with gold. But here's the interesting thing. Haggai has that same message. Not that everything's his. In this case, it's just all the silver and gold is his. That's really the message from uh, Haggai. All the silver and gold uh, is mine. Here's Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 saying something similar. Um, Everything is permissible. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible. Not everything is constructive. Uh, Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For... The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So Paul is instructing the church at Corinth that it's okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. There's nothing, because there's no such thing as an idol as ultimately. But later Paul will say, however, if doing that is going to cause your brother to stumble, don't do it. But there's nothing wrong with it. There's no such thing as idols. Why? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So... um, It took all that time and all these passages and so on to come up with this. I I wrote this myself. Uh, Everything belongs to God. All right. Good time to close in prayer, huh? Got to kind of nail that one. We we just, um, yeah, anyway, that's that's, that's what we want. How, How many own a house? You see that? None of you do. Did you see how we think? I own a house. I own a couple cars. These are my clothes, I'm wearing my shoes. Do you see it? This is the problem that Old Testament Israel, New Testament, the people around the life of Jesus, and the church through the history, we all think of the stuff as ours. I set you up, I set you up. And I would have fallen for it too, right? I own a house. I mean, why doesn't God make the mortgage payment every month, right? I have to. This is a question of how we think. Do we think that everything is the Lord's? He's entrusted you with the house, right? If you put up your hand, you own a house, right? He's entrusted you with the house. He might have entrusted you with a car or a truck. He's entrusted you with funds. He might have entrusted you with stocks and bonds. He's entrusted you with all other things. It's all his. That's been the message throughout the Old and New Testament. It all belongs to God. But it's hard to think about. Think about something that you worked really hard for, a really long time to get. Maybe it's your house, or a boat, or a vacation, or or worked your way up to six weeks off a year, or or whatever it might be, something that you worked for. And if you worked really hard for something, and you finally got it, and it took a lot of work to get there, and you finally got it, doesn't it feel like yours? And so what God is trying to instruct us, Old Testament and New, and what we're going to start to say is this idea of we are only stewards of all that's his. We don't own anything. We have silly sayings. We have sayings like, don't accumulate too much here because when you die, you can't take any of it with you. You know why you can't take any of it with you? It never was yours. It belongs here to whoever made it. Does that that make sense? That that, that we, we don't always think about this the right way because over and over we're reminded that all things are God's. And so we as believers need to think about things differently. I've already said that wrong because we're not really even talking about things. The air you breathe is God's. You know, the earth you walk on is God's. The time you have to live is in the hands of the Lord, right? Our time belongs to God. That is, this isn't really about stuff, although stuff is included in it. That that our, some of you went and got education, you became, you know, a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or whatever it might be. Some of you might have great technical skill and, and, and ability to analyze. Some of you, your personality is just perfect for sales and, and, and you did sales in your career and, and, and you did amazing or God gave you that and 
he allowed you to be amazing in your career. Right? right? It's how are we going to look at this? And, and so this is what we're going to talk about is the issue of we are called to be stewards. And the question is, what kind of steward will we be? I want us to return to a passage we've already looked at a bunch of times, which will be our command. Romans 12, you can go there in your Bible if you want. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Again, Paul is writing, and the first 11 chapters are all the theology of salvation. And then in Romans 12, he moves from the theology of what is going on when Christ saves us, our lostness, the role of the Spirit. He's talking about justification, sanctification, glorification, and all the things that he covers. And then from Romans 12 to 16, Paul is going to talk about the implications of that. In other words, first we learn what it is, and then the next thing we learn is why it matters. And this is where it turns, with this word, therefore. It, it's very much Paul uses the same formula in Ephesians 1 to 3, how the church works, the theology of the church, and uh, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, the implications of that theology. Here he's using that same pattern. By the way, it's the same way Colossians works. One and two uh, is the theology of Christ, and three is four is the implications of the theology of, of Christ. And so uh, it's very much a, a Pauline system where he, he, uh, he creates a hinge passage as he moves from um, the, the teaching to the implications of the teaching. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. What does Paul mean? What is the imagery of a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God? You know the rest. Don't be conformed. Have your mind renewed. Um, you can test and approve what God's will is. It, it's all important, but I just want to pick, on this, pick up on this idea. We are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. C can you start to see, even with this language, God's not calling you to sort of build a fire in an altar and jump on it, right? I mean, I think we see that. He's not calling here in Romans 12 verse 1 to do the same thing that Abraham was called to do to Isaac, Right? So you need to be a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. This isn't about, you know, somehow killing ourselves in a sacrificial act or something. But it is the right imagery, right? I mean, the sacrifice is the right imagery. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. That is, your life is lived out sacrificially what? What does it mean? That's really what I want to start to explore. What does it mean that he's asking for? And so the word I want to use is stewardship. It's not really a biblical word. We'll talk about the various passages here. Um, but, but, but the idea is we are to offer, we are to give our bodies in sacrifice. I'm going to show you some New Testament examples that'll, that, that'll help us to, to, to see these things. But ultimately what God is asking for, you, you remember back to when we talked about love, and you remember we we're called to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And that's the idea of loving him with everything you have or everything you are. Well, th this is all very similar. What is it that we're supposed to sacrifice? We're supposed to sacrifice, in this sense, everything. Everything is a spiritual act of worship. So let's talk about money, because money is always a, a fun one. That, and then, oh, how much do you need? Oh, what are we supposed to give? Well, from what we've seen so far, we often want to talk about percents, and some are like, well, you, you, know, you really should give 10, and then some you know, get deeper into the Old Testament uh, uh, giving system or, or even the sacrificial system. They recognize there's a, there's a, a tabernacle tax that will turn into a temple tax and so on. Well, really, it's maybe closer to 12.5%, uh, or, or some are looking for amounts and so on. It's very easy to know what the Lord wants, 100%. But it's a little different than what we think. Man, you want us to give everything? No, I just want you to recognize it's all his. Right? And then give what you want. Right? In other words, giving, just as an illustration. Remember, all the gold and silver is God's already. So he doesn't need your money. So why would we give money then? Great, we use, you just give me proof I can keep my money. Yeah, you can keep any money that's yours, any money that's his, you're accountable to him for. And it's all his. Everything you've earned is his. Everything you invested in wisely is his. Everything that's going up and down on the stock market, it's his. Right? Because it's all his. That, that's part of what we're seeing. It's all his. That, that's part of the thing. 
you can be a good steward of it. And, and so, well, what's the percentage you need to give? It's simple. It's 100%. It's always 100%. That is, whatever money you have ever been entrusted to, you're accountable to God. So what we, oh, man, and I went to Starbucks today. Well, is God against you? Maybe a coffee for you is something that you like to have to relax or is something that stimulates you to work in the afternoon or whatever it might be. Is God against any of those things? No. What if you spent some money um, on your wife? Is God against you spending money on your wife? No. What if you spend money to pay the guy to cut the lawn? Is God against you spending money to have your lawn cut? No. You see, the issue isn't God wants you to take 100%. And it, it, the issue is recognizing as we spend any money that we're ever, we're ever responsible for, that it's all his. It's okay that you used your money to buy the clothes that you wear, Right? But everything could get misused. If you use all the money and only money to buy more clothes and more than you need and more than you could want, more than you can have, then we misuse it, of course. But all the money we have is his. But this really isn't about money. That's not even really the... The issue is everything that we are is his. Our thoughts belong to him. Our attitudes belong to him. And so when we talk about living the Christian life, one of the things he wants to do in the realm of stewardship is he wants us to do certain things that are representative of spiritual realities. And so one of the things in the realm of offering your, little, your, li- uh, offering your body as a living sacrifice is going to be giving. And one of the things is money. So we'll talk about money just for a moment here, but, but it's much more than that. And, and so what he asks for is, I want you to give recognizing it was all mine to begin with. Oh, so how much should it be? I don't know. Give the right amount. Right? In other words, we don't get clear New Testament teaching. Everyone needs to give so and so, such and such. We don't get that. What we get is it's all God's. Recognize it as you spend it, save it, share it. Right? In other words, use what you've been given in a godly manner. But money is the least of our concerns. I think our bigger concern is our time. Or maybe our minds, what we think about. Or what we fill our minds with. Or how we look at others. And so this is what we're going to start to work on is, what does it mean if God owns everything, if everything that we are belongs to him, then how does that work itself out? How is it that we are supposed to live this way? And so this is what I want us to to think about as we even think, you know, Paul's command here to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, that, that, that we are to be stewards of all that we are for him, for his purposes. So uh, it doesn't say everyone needs to volunteer at the local church. Can. There's lots of needs for those things here. But, but notice it's not, there's a freedom for you as an individual, for families, as specific families and so on, for communities, to, to work these things out amongst themselves. This is the beauty of the fact that the Bible doesn't give us legalism. It just says giving is a really interesting thing. When you give something, let's say it's money, let's say it's your time, let's say it's your, it's, it's your talent and, and your, your skills or abilities and you offer that to someone, uh, when you give those, it's a reminder, hey, that actually comes from God. That's all. It, it's a physical sign of a spiritual reality. That's what giving is. God doesn't need your money. It's already his. And you know what he can do if he really wants it from you? He can say your time's up, and then you have to leave it, right? It's, it's always his. And, and it's, in one sense, it's very, very freeing because there's nothing wrong with trying to build a business or trying to you know, be more successful, but it all matters as to how you view it. If you view building your business as you, well, then we've missed the fact that, no, it's actually all his, including the abilities you have, to build businesses or make investments or whatever that might be. 
And, and so this is what's part of what it means to be a steward, offering yourself as a living sacrifice. A little later in Romans, Romans 14 here, uh, I want to look at this. Uh, it is written, Paul writes here, As surely as I live, the, uh, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every, t- every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Oh, is this about money? No, not really. It's just an account of everything. And, and so when we talk about the Christian life, sometimes we, we, we use funny language that doesn't really make sense. You know, Come on, guys, you, you can't just be Christians on Sunday. Well, you're right, you, you can't, because a believer in Jesus recognizes that now their life has been transformed, and now we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. It's not day-specific, right? It, it, it never was just about Sundays or, or some other day of the week, for that matter. And, and, and so this is interesting. We give an account, and everyone does. Everyone has to account for their lives before God. A believer, an unbeliever, everyone gives an account. And so as believers, we're called to whatever we do, however we think, whatever we have, however we serve our spouse, our family, ourselves. Uh, and, and I'll show you some of the things that are all part of, uh, out of uh, th- this idea as offering uh, yourself as a living sacrifice. We, we recognize that there is a component of it that it represents our relationship to God. Does that make sense? Our lives, the way we live them, represents our relationship to God. All right, Philippians chapter 4, back to the Apostle Paul. So Philippians is another, Philippi is another church that Paul plants. Philippi is an interesting one. It's the first church in Europe. If you remember the story on Paul's second missionary journey, he's praying to go to Asia Minor. That's where he really would like to go. And if he's going to Asia Minor, the big city in Asia Minor is Ephesus. Assuming he, that's what he's trying to do, he's trying to get to Ephesus. And I'm making that assumption because that's the main city in Asia Minor where he's trying to go. But the, the Lord has said no, and so they're like, where do we go? The Lord's kind of closed that door. And so you remember, he gets a, a dream. In a dream, he has a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come up here. And, and Paul takes that as a sign from the Lord that they're to go to Macedonia. And so when they cross over to Macedonia, they cross over to Europe, the first major place they go is Philippi, and he ends up planting a church in Philippi. You'll remember uh, maybe some of the stories. The stories uh, unfold in Acts chapter 16. And again, he plants the church in Philippi and finds himself traveling around. And eventually, if we understand all the story correctly, will find himself in prison in Rome, He'd love to go back to Philippi and see his uh, believers there and, and encourage the church there. Uh, but he's in prison, and so he writes the letter. So the church, the letter of Philippians is a letter from Paul. We think he's in Rome in prison, uh, or at least under house arrest, maybe not in prison, but under house arrest tied uh, um, to a Praetorian guard, writing the letter and sending it back to Philippi to encourage them. Philippians is really all about uh, encouragement and joy. We're going to pick up the story at the end of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord, Paul writes, that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am saying this because um, I am in need, for I have... uh, Excuse me. I am not saying this because I am in need, because I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know uh, what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether fed or hungry, whether living with plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. So notice we kind of know verse 13. But verse 13, the idea of all things or all this, it's the translation I have, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. The this is living with plenty or with very little. I can can do it either way, okay? I'm not sure it directly relates to Step Back Threes by Steph Curry. I know that's what it says on his shoes. It says I can do all things. Maybe. It's a bit of a stretch in the the Greek here. But but what it certainly means is this idea of, and I like Steph, I I don't want to pick on that, but we've got to be really careful that we don't isolate all things, and now all things means something different than that we can be content regardless of our physical circumstances. 
Okay, so let's see if we can understand Paul's physical circumstances. So let's say the Apostle Paul gets arrested, which he did, and then he ends up in a Roman prison. Now here he's probably not in prison, he's in a house arrest, but uh, prison's really interesting. I'll talk about prison for a moment. Um, So let's say you, for example, might want to eat in prison. Well, hopefully someone brings you food. I mean, the Romans don't have sort of a a budget set aside for food for prisoners. That would be for someone to bring if the prisoner was going to live or they just starved to death. So think about the Apostle Paul's needs. He's not in prison, but he's not able under house arrest really to raise money as, as he's, he's, you remember the ship, shipwreck and the journey all the way to Rome and, and, and all the things that, that, that go on with him. And so he's dependent on people in the churches to provide for his needs as best they can. The poor church in Philippi is a long ways from Rome, and they don't even know where he's at from time to time. Remember, it's a lot harder to follow people back in those days. So the Apostle Paul is traveling, and then he gets arrested, and he's on this shipwreck, and, and all these different stories going on, and, and, and they're trying to figure out, um, you know, how do we help him? And Paul is saying, you know, I'm content in any circumstance, w- which, is, which is interesting, but the church at Philippi cared, and now we'll sort of keep following the story here, the church at Philippi cared. F- verse 14, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles, Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. Okay? So if we remember Paul's second missionary journey, he, he, he's, he first revisits the churches that he planted in the first missionary journey. He seems to want to go, well, he does want to go to Asia Minor. I'm thinking he wants to go to Ephesus, which is the capital city of Asia Minor. God says no. He has this dream, this vision. He goes up into Macedonia. He plants a church at Philippi. From there, he goes down to Thessalonica. He plants a church there. Later, we're going to get First and Second Thessalonians. He'll go over to Berea, and I don't think he plants a church there, but there's a ministry amongst Berea where people, remember, are following up and searching the scriptures for themselves to see if what Paul is saying is correct, as in, does the Old Testament point to Jesus? That's the real question that's being wrestled with in Berea. He goes down to Athens. You remember that sermon in Athens? He talks about to the unknown God. Remember, he walks around Athens. They got all these gods and all these idols, and he preaches that message uh, um, uh, at the Aragopolis on uh, to the unknown God. And then he makes his way to Corinth, and he plants a church in Corinth, and later we're going to get First and Second Corinthians. And so you we're thinking of Thessalonica and that church there, and we're thinking of Corinth and that church there. And then he's going to make his way, and we've got all the churches that that, that he passed in the Galatia. So that's uh, th- those churches in Antioch there, Antioch uh, um, in, in the north there, and, and then uh, um, uh, uh, the, the other uh, three cities in the, in the Glacier region there, and all those churches, none of them support him, but Philippi, that's what he's saying, okay? And so he makes this point, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except only you, for even when I was in Thessalonica, which is not too far away, uh, about a two-day walk from Philippi, a uh, day and a half, Uh, You sent me uh, aid more than once uh, while I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Okay, so he's not worried about how much he's getting. He likes the fact that they're giving. Why? Because giving is a physical sign of a spiritual reality. The spiritual reality is we care for our brother Paul, our pastor who planted this church, and so that he really likes. The money is great. I mean, it's fine, but that doesn't matter. The Lord will provide in, in, in any way, and, and Paul can live in little. He can live in much. He can do all things uh, through Christ who strengthens him. So um, I have, a, 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 so he says, uh, not that I desire your gifts. I desire more, to be cre- more for it to be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied uh, now that I've received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Okay. He is literally chained to Roman special forces at the time when he writes this. I'm sure the soldier he's changed to is reading over his shoulder going, <laughs> really? Right? He's literally locked to the Praetorian Guard, the Roman special forces that are set aside to guard Caesar. That's who Paul is chained to while he's writing about he's got more than enough. Everything is good. 
You know, whatever kind of house arrest situation he's in, and we think he's kind of in a, in a house, he's able to receive visitors. We know that for a fact. Um, and, and, and so he's got more than enough. Not, not concerned about that, but I'm so glad of the gifts you brought through Epaphroditus. So just quickly so you understand this, it appears Epaphroditus is a guy who is from Philippi. The church at Philippi gets together something for Paul. I want to be careful because I, we don't actually know it's money. So I, I don't think it's baked goods, because from walking from Philippi to Rome, at least 40 days. So, so there's a long walk, and then there's a sea, because you've got to get over to Italy, right? You've got to cross the sea there, and, and then more walking. And, and so it, it's, a, it's a journey. It's a journey. So a fresh bake probably wouldn't work. But they put something together. It might be Paul. Remember, when Paul's in custody, giving him money doesn't help him either. Because then he has to give the money to someone. Can you go get me food, right? And, you know, food and his, maybe he needs a cloak or whatever. So maybe it's money. But, but think about this. Like, we, we transfer money and we're careful and, and we tend not to carry a lot of cash and so on. In these days, there, there's nothing digital or whatever. So if you're going to bring something, you're going to carry it. Philippi is a city, and I'm guessing here, I'll just tell you I'm guessing, but it's just interesting. Philippi is a city that was primarily settled by retired Roman soldiers, and so, if you remember, Paul and Silas will plant the gospel message there. You'll remember they get followed around by a girl who has a demon possession. And, and yeah, what do you want to do with us, you know, you who preach of the Son of God and so on. And Paul gets annoyed and he casts out the demons. And her handlers, who are making money from her, uh, uh, now can't make money because she's not demon possessed. And so they rouse up the crowd and then the crowd ends up saying, you know, Paul and Silas, they're destroying our city and they get put in prison, right? And they're beaten. I should say that first, they're beaten, put in prison. And remember that night, then they're singing, and while they're singing the, the, the hymns, there's an earthquake that God sends, and the prison doors and the foundations are all broken. All their shackles are gone, and, and they still got verse 2 and verse 3, and then they're probably two. And so they keep singing. The jailer thinks that they've all left, and no, no, we're still here, and we're still singing. The jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And so the jailer and his family are part of that church body. Well, Epaphroditus, we don't know his background, but he could very well have been a Roman soldier. Which you kind of think, yeah, that's the kind of guy we'd pick, right? If we were all to get together and say, hey, I want you to carry a bunch of valuable funds or whatever it might be for the Apostle Paul, and you've got to make a 40-day journey, give or take, uh, by walking, we'd want a big, strong guy, right? And so that might very well be who Epaphroditus is. So he takes whatever the, the church at Ephesus, uh, excuse me, the church at Philippi has for Paul, and he journeys all the way and finds Paul in Rome and brings him whatever it is that they brought him, m money and other things, encouragement notes, whatever it might be, and, and, and he brings that to him and spends some time with Paul, as it turns out, while he's with Paul, he gets sick and he almost dies, which is interesting, also found uh, here. But, but so Paul is really just so excited to have his church bring something, which is fine. He's not really worried about his material needs, but have his church bring something. And in bringing something, I got to talk to Epaphroditus and hear how you all are doing and so on. So here's what he says. Um, I am amply supplied now that I have received Epaphroditus. That's the guy from Philippi who brought that. And what we think is Paul writes the letter of Philippians and sends Epaphroditus back home. And literally Epaphroditus brings our letter, Philippians, to the church at Philippi. And that's how it ends up there. We think, you know, he's a, he plays offense and defense, right? A two-way player, is that what we call him? Um, and, and so Epaphroditus, the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering and an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to the Lord. You lost me, Paul. Ha, uh, what's a fragrant offering? The money? Well, that's not what Paul said. Now that I have received Epaphroditus, from Epaphroditus, the gifts you sent, the gifts you sent, you're giving a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, a fragrant offering. Well, fragrant offering, that's kind of Old Testament language. What did it mean to give a fragrant offering to the Lord? Well, often that was done with things like incense, and you gave a fragrant offering as a way of worshiping the Lord. At the, at the appropriate time, a fragrant offering was what the Lord required in, 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 in regards to sh showing our love for the Lord. And so Paul, Paul is saying, your giving is like that fragrant offering. Do you see? 
Paul says in Romans 12, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. What did Epaphroditus do? I'll carry the goods from Philippi to Rome. And then Paul says, will you carry this letter back? I'll carry the letter from Paul back to Philippi. That's giving. That's stewardship. In other words, he was the letter carrier. He was the one who brought the goods from the church at Philippi to Paul. He probably brought the letter from Paul back to the church at Philippi. It's a fragrant offering. It's an acceptable sacrifice. It's pleasing to God. That's what God calls us to do. That God calls us to live for him, work for him, volunteer for him, serve him, whatever capacity you are. This is what it means to live for him. Was Epaphroditus super rich? Well, we don't know that, but I doubt it. Was he somehow super, some kind of a superhero in strength? No, we don't, don't see any of that. But it was a gift to Paul while he was under house arrest. And it was appreciated. The, the, the funds, however much it was, doesn't say, doesn't matter. It's not the issue. But it's a fragrant offering pleasing to the Lord. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Paul doesn't have any money to send, send back. But he's not worried. He's, he'd love to help the church at Philippi. But he's like, this is what God does. He meets our needs. This is the picture we have. To our God, our Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. The final phrases from uh, the book of Philippians. And so this is the idea. This is a picture of a spiritual sacrifice. This is the idea uh, behind it. Giving, and I don't mean money. I just mean whatever. Time, talents, help, walking a letter or, or, or funds from Philippi to, to Rome and walking a letter back from Rome to Philippi. It's an act of worship. So this is how we're supposed to live. All these things kind of fit together. We think about what we do and it's for the Lord. It, it, there's a spiritual reality behind the work that we do, how, how we serve others, how we honor others in whichever ways God has called you to do. Mark 12, I love this passage. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the, uh, where the offerings were being put and watched the crowd put their money into the temple treasury. Okay? Any of you ushers in here? Several? Good, yeah. So I don't know if you ever noticed, but ushers, they, they have this way about them. They, they, they pass the, the bucket or the plate or whatever they're passing, and then they, they look over you. They never watch what's going in. Right? That's how we do it, because no one's supposed to know. Everything's a secret. Right? No, one, no one knows. Okay, so Jesus pulls up a chair, and he's going to sit in front of the, the box they're giving in, and that's, his plan is, well, what, what do you got planned for today? Oh, let's watch giving. Let's watch people give. And so you can imagine, you know how it is when everyone's milling around, and then all of a sudden there's a quiet time, and someone who's really wealthy, that's when they throw in a bunch of coins, right? And it's just incidental that it's really quiet, and then they dump all this, whoosh, and you hear all the coins coming in, and everyone looks, and, and you get the attention, right? Everyone gets the attention, the, the wealthy are giving. So this is Jesus' plan. He sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put and watched the crowd putting their monies into the temple treasury. Okay, so it's the exact opposite mindset of the way we do it, where no one looks and no one sees says anything and everyone he's watching many rich people through large amounts but a poor widow came and put two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny okay so when you talk, want to talk amount or value essentially nothing almost nothing calling his disciples to him jesus said i tell you the truth this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others and the disciples thought, boy, he's bad at math. Right? I mean, she, she didn't. Right? Some put in big coins worth lots of money. She, she didn't put in more. She, she put what, what, a fraction of a penny. That's what she put in her two copper coins, a fraction of a penny. They all gave out of their wealth. She, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. Do you see how giving is not about an amount or a percentage? It's about the spiritual reality behind it. What she wanted to do was give. She had next to nothing. 
The nice thing is if you keep reading Mark 12, it shows how she's provided for and everything's fine. Except that's not true. She's never mentioned again. So, so what happened? I don't know. She gave everything and she trusted the Lord. Oh, this is one of those heavy things. You want me to give all my money, right? You want to give all my money? Well, it's only happened a few times. It's happened through church history several times. It happened a couple times. So you remember when the church is planted early on, people are holding everything in common. And so it starts to become a thing where people are bringing, uh, you know, sort of everything, everything they have and throwing it in the pile. And then everyone works from the pile. Everyone has their, their immediate needs met, right? And then as soon as that idea comes out, you get a perversion of it. Ananias and Sapphira, right? They have some land, great. They want to sell the land, fine. They don't have to, they choose to. They sell the land and we want to give it to the church, fine. We don't want to give all of it to the church, fine. No problem. (laughs) But we want the church to think that we gave all of it to them even while we hold some back. Okay, not, not fine. Right? So now the thing with Ananias and Sapphira is not about giving or helping the church. It has nothing. It's this perverted idea that we want everyone to think we're giving everything when we're going to hold some back. Just hold some back. It's not a big deal. No, no. We want everyone to think we're giving everything. And Ananias and Sapphira are struck dead the day they do that. And, and, and so that's not what it's saying. It's not saying... Everyone's got to put everything in the plate. Start off by remembering everything you have is his. That's our starting point. Everything, the the air that we breathe, the land that we live on, the taxes that we pay, it's all his. And, And so in recognizing that it's his, act wisely. Give generously. Not only financially, but live as a living sacrifice. That's the idea here. Giving, what Jesus is saying here, reflects God's provision. A couple of passages and we'll close. Deuteronomy 15. If there is a a poor man among you, what what Jesus is giving here is, uh, excuse me, what God is giving in the back to the book of Deuteronomy is, once you settle the land, here's how I want things to work. So this is about God's plan for the, the land of Israel that he's giving his people, the promised land. If there is a poor man among your brothers in any of the towns in the land that the Lord your God is giving you, uh, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend uh, him whatever he needs. <clears throat> be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debt, is, year, is near. So, <clears throat> so that you do not show ill will toward your needy brother and give him nothing. Let's keep reading here. Um, he, uh, he may then appeal to the Lord against you, and you will be found guilty of sin. Give generously to him and do so without a gr- uh, grudging heart. Um, then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and everything you put your hand to do. So the whole point is, there's going to be poor. A- and God is setting up a system where on the seventh year all the debts go back to zero, right? And if you think about it, in our world economy, we are in so much debt that there is no hope of anyone paying back anyone in the light of how the the exchange and and, and how it all works. God had a system where everything gets back to zero every seven years. So you can lend money, but after the end of seven years, everything goes back to zero. And so... Don't say, oh man, we're only one year away. The last thing I'm going to do is is lend this guy money. I might not get any of it back. It's God's, right? And what does God do? You help God reach the poor. God helps you. You see it? That that he's got this, and it's not even about money. It's about land. It's about shelter. It's about whatever it might be that God builds this system here. Three times a year, back again in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, you and all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Tabernacles. There are three feasts every year. No man should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must give a gift in proportion to the way the Lord has blessed you. Oh, how much? You choose. It's all his. Right? It, 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 it's not legalism that he's trying to, it's trying to recognize, hey, we give a portion because it's all his. It helps us to remember those things. It's a physical sign of a spiritual reality. It's also interesting, God controlled Israel's, Israel's schedule. You know what some men struggle with? 
rest. Time off. You know what we see in the Old Testament? Some don't go to the festivals. God says, on such and such a date, this is what you're going to do, and you're going to take a break for seven days. No, no. My land needs more work. I'm going to, honey, you go. I'm going to stay here. I've got to keep working the land. And then God doesn't bless that. He asks you to leave the land which requires more work, to trust him, you take time off. For some, rest is a living sacrifice. Right? It's not easy to do. God wants us to have rest. So he doesn't create a burden. What he asks us to remember as believers is that we are to be stewardship, we should be good stewards of all that we have, because all that we have is from him. And all that we have is for him. Father, we're grateful for this reminder that it all belongs to you. And it's hard not to think of our stuff as ours, as my stuff as mine. But when we stop and think about it, you are the creator of all things. And, and that all that we have is a gift from you. And, and, and that any of our abilities is a gift from you. And the fact that you gave us today is a gift from you. And the fact that if you choose, you will give us tomorrow, that too is a gift from you. Help us to live as good stewards of all that you've given, of all that we have. Help us to recognize that everything reflects the spiritual reality of our changed lives, that our forgiveness comes through Jesus, and that we want to honor you with the way we act and with how we speak and how we spend and save and uh, the way we use our time and our talents, that it all is to be for you. Father, help us to be living sacrifices as Paul describes in Romans 12, that we would offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, everything that we are, to honor you, not to earn salvation that comes through Christ, but to reflect the salvation that you have so generously given to hold all things loosely, recognizing that it's you who provides every good and perfect gift. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Have a good week.